Hello there. Welcome to the latest episode of the Data Radio Show. It's going to be a fascinating one where we catch up with the news and, well, there's a bit of an education coming up for you as well around the difference between large language models and small language models and what might be better for whichever enterprise is asking about them. All that coming up now on the Data Radio Show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. I'm shaking things up just a little bit for this one. You see, after the news, we're going to catch up with Shung Lan. You might remember Shung from one of our earlier episodes. He's the lead data scientist for Tech Data, and he is so smart. It's, it's actually kind of intimidating. But this week, I wanted to have a chat to him about something he's been doing the talk circuit around Australia with. He's been looking into the differences between large language models and small language models because well, when it comes to enterprise, a lot of people have in their head, large language model is the way to go because that's all they hear about on the internet. But in reality, that might not necessarily be the best fit for them for a number of reasons. So shung has been running some experiments on some really large language models and some small language models and a medium language model to basically find out what's going to be the difference between them, which one is faster or has more latency issues, which one uses more power or has faster response times. Like there's a lot of stuff in there. So make sure you grab your pen and paper so you can take some notes or I guess open your notes app and get ready for that one. But that will be up after the news. So let's jump over there now and catch up with this week's news. Predicting the future of data science was the topic covered in a recent blog post from Simple Learning, highlighting the six top rated data science programs from reputed universities and industry leaders. These different courses offer practical academic training in machine learning, Python, data visualization, and generative AI. As the demand for skilled data science and data engineering professionals rapidly grows, understanding where the future lies in data science is relevant as you look at the next steps in your career. The top picks by us for this article include integration with AI and machine learning using LLMs to augment current data and analytics workflow is a big one. Deep learning will continue to revolutionize the capabilities of data science, particularly in fields such as image and speech recognition, natural language processing, and anomaly detection. This will enhance the automation of pattern recognition and decision-making processes. Quantum computing and specialized processing units will revolutionize how big data is processed and analyzed. Edge data processing and use of local language models is set to change data architecture and workloads along with the time to insight at the edge. Automated and augmented analytics, automation and data science through technologies like AutoML is expected to grow. These tools can automatically analyze data and generate insights without human intervention, making data science more accessible to non-experts and delivering productivity gains. And lastly, data governance and quality. A career in data and analytics will increasingly focus on ensuring high quality, accurate and reliable data in business and government especially as businesses depend more heavily on data-driven decisions. You can actually read more about this as well in the section down below for the description. I'll have a link down there for everyone to check out. Databricks has developed an AI security framework that covers four stages of the AI lifecycle, including data operations, model operations, model deployment, and service. The framework is designed to improve teamwork across business, IT data, AI and security groups. It simplifies AI and ML concepts by cataloging the knowledge base of AI security risks based on real-world attack observations and offer immediate application. You can check out the white paper in the description down below. In a related news, analytics platform Tableau has expanded its AI capabilities, including assisted data transformation and the ability to explore metrics in natural language. These features will be available in the coming months. The enhancements aim to make analytics more accessible to a wider range of users within an organization. Finally this week, Microsoft Research has published a paper on spatial reasoning in large language models, essentially enabling models to think visually. The paper talks about how large language models have exhibited impressive performance in language comprehension and various reasoning tasks. However, their abilities in spatial reasoning, a crucial aspect of human cognition, remain relatively unexplored. Humans possess a remarkable ability to create mental images of unseen objects and actions through a process known as the mind's eye, enabling the imagination of the unseen world. 
Inspired by this cognitive capacity, the researchers have proposed the concept of visualization of thought, or VOT prompting. VOT aims to elicit spatial reasoning by LLMs by visualizing their reasoning traces, thereby guiding subsequent reasoning steps. This is a fascinating development in the world of AI, which has major implications wherever spatial reasoning needs to be applied. Uh, I'll make sure you can read more about this in the paper below. Uh, just check out the description for more information. And that was the news for this week. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and have your say as a community member. And don't forget, this week's news has already been brought to you by Wearscape. Wearscape helps IT organizations leverage automation to design, develop, deploy, and operate data infrastructure faster. More than 1,200 customers worldwide rely on Wearscape automation to eliminate hand coding and other repetitive, time-intensive tasks to deliver data warehouses, vaults, lakes, and marts in days or weeks rather than in months or years. Wearscape has global operations in the United States, the United Kingdom, Singapore, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, and can be found online at wearscape.com. Right, I actually wanted to do something a little bit different for the next section. Usually, I would sit down and have a chat with somebody who works in the industry and we get to know them a little bit better. But last week, well, there were a couple of meetings around the place about what the future of Gen AI actually looks like. And one of the ones that sort of blew me away was around iterative training for language models. And that might be a small language model or a large language model. And that was actually done by Shung Lan, who we interviewed a few weeks ago on the show. In this particular t instance, though, his talk was all about some testing and experiments that he'd done to basically see what was going to be the best value out of different sorts of models, a large language model or a small language model or something in between, in terms of how fast they are, what their latency is, their accuracy, how quickly they learn and what their carbon footprint is. So I brought him on to basically run us through his presentation so we could learn a little bit more about that together. So you might want to grab a pen and paper for this one and make some notes along the way because it is really fascinating to see some of the results that he's got on. So let's jump in and go and catch up with Shung. Uh, Shung, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I am really very curious about something that you've been up to lately. You were involved in um, a sort of industry meetup not that long ago called Adapting to the Age of Gen AI, which is obviously a huge topic for people to talk about at the moment. Um, and a lot of your work in this was focusing around prompt engineering, which is, I think it's one of those areas that people need to learn more about because you know, Gen AI feels like big and scary stuff to people who don't know what's going on. But prompt engineering is the tool I'm guessing that you use to teach AI how to do what it needs to do. Um, so I figured I'd ask you, could you tell me a little bit more about what happened and, and basically run us through what it was that you were talking about? Yeah, um, sounds good. So in the age of AI, I think we all heard this concept called co-create or co-work with AI. Since this uh, release of a chat GPT, I has used uh, generative AI to help me do the coding um, to proofreading my uh, content or speech script. I feel like it's difficult to go back to the days we don't have that tool. And I also heard some surveys that people will prefer um, co-pilot in the work uh, rather than a free launch. <laughs> so you can see some people is really get used to that, the, the productivity and easy to do uh, and with generative AI. Um, and also in this generative AI time, a new skill called prompt engineering is become more and more popular. Um, uh, in my opinion is the concept is not very new. So it's basically to say some people is very good at to communicating the large language model and get what they want. Um, if you think about the software engineer, um, that is have similar concept. It's basically, basically people are very good at communicating with computers or machines to get what they want. So the concept I think is um, familiar, but the difference here is uh, for software engineer, they use a specific programming language, Python, Java, but for prompt engineering, you use uh, English or other uh, natural language, Chinese uh, to do that. So that make it more important since um, almost everyone, if you speak English, you know how to ask questions, how to do that. So I think it's very advanced tool um, in this uh, AI era and everyone should get something from it to improve your 
uh, work improve your daily life. <laughs> so that is um, the overall prompt engineering is very important um, in the work environment, also um, daily life. Um, for today, the topic I delivered before is maybe not only for individuals, but it's more to um, on this enterprise side. So since some opinion may think um, it doesn't make much difference in uh, individual level. For example, you use prompt uh, to talk to ChatGPT. You may get a good meeting summary in one question, or you may try two or three times. It's not a big deal, right? But if you think about on um, enterprise level, you need to scale up for maybe 100 or 1,000, even 10,000 times, people use the same prompt for a task. So all that a little bit faster, a little bit accurate, and a little bit carbon friendly will make a big difference. And today I will talk more about uh, this um, how prompt engineering to help you get faster, better, and more sustainable AI for business. And to do that, we will um, run an um, experiment to, to show these numbers. Um, so the experiment hypothesis is with the right prompt, we can achieve similar or even better performance using smaller size large language model. So if we have smaller size large language model, the benefit will be one is faster since it's small, two is um, more carbon friendly, more sustainable, and uh, it doesn't require uh, as much as the power to, to run that as a large one, uh, large one. And also we get a similar or even better performance. And the performance we're talking here, mainly from the three metrics. One is uh, accuracy. If we think about the classification or prediction, uh, you have your actual data like ground truth, you compare to your prediction. If you get 10 uh, out of 20 correct, that is 50% accuracy. Mm -hmm. If you get 20, 20 out of 20, that is 100. So for now, we let's say, assuming we accepting 75% is our like bottom line. If it's over this accuracy, we're good. The second metrics we're talking about latency, basically how fast the model will respond. Uh, the third one will be the cost, how much um, it will cost us to, to run this model. Um, the task we are using here is a common one, is to classify a customer complaint into five categories. Common example is like customers say, I called an uh, American Express email uh, receipt and blah, blah. The category will be a credit card. So it's helped the user to triage this complaint to the right team to handle that. Uh, it's not very easy since this is a simple example, but when people complain, we are not happy, they may just fire away, typing a lot of content and not with perfect logic. Uh, mm -hmm. Some complaint can be very long. So <clears throat> then our candidate for uh, for this um, experiment, um, basically- oh, Those the, are the cutest llamas ever. <laughs> yeah, the language models. And uh, this is um, actually, this is, I think the uh, Meta Llama 3 official image on the GitHub. I just use that. Oh. So the Llama 3 stand for language, a uh, large language model uh, from Meta AI so that they just pick the right character, mm -hmm. get Llama. The three mean this is the third series of this model. It's one of the best open uh, accessible model in the market, I just released recently. And it's also available on uh, Watson, IBM Watson X, and we'll use Watson X for this experiment. And there's a two version of this uh, Llama 3 models. Um, based on the size of the model, the larger one have a 70 billion parameters. And uh, the size is around 280 gigabyte. So what is the parameter we're talking here? So if we think about a very uh, simple example, there is um, a mathematical formula, let's say 3 multiply x plus 2 multiply y, plus one equal to Z. 
this can be a simple model to predict if it's snowing or not. For example, the X will be the temperature, Y will be this um, precipitation, and V will be a number. We, we use that number if it's larger than a certain number, certain value, we think it's snowing. If it's smaller than certain value, we think it's not snowing. And this is the three parameter model. Basically this three, mm -hmm. two, one, that is three parameter. So think about three billion parameters and even larger than that, 70 billion and 100 billion. So when this model is extremely scale up, um, I, always, I always wonder if is something happened or is some miracle happened. And in my opinion, um, I think something different happened. I call that miracle or people commonly call that AI emergent ability. So that means some unpredictable intelligence just show up when you training this model on this massively uh, large data. Uh, that always um, fascinating to me and also a little bit scare <laughs> is um, unpredictable. Yeah. <laughs> um, so back to the candidate for this uh, language model, we have a smaller size model from Llama, which is only have eight billion parameters. It's like, um, uh, we'll say nine, yeah, nine times, nearly nine times smaller. And the, the, another candidate we have is from Google. This one is even smaller, only have three billion models. And then we'll use this three, uh, large language model with different size, I will say X small, small and large to mm -hmm. run the same task, the classification, customer complaint classification task. Um, I run that in Watson X, so I will skip that um, part. Basically, we got a evaluation report. On that evaluation report, you, you will get the data for accuracy, for the latency, and mm -hmm. also for the cost, which is pick the number and um, in our um, final result. And um, overall, this um, experiment is like a iteratively um, process. It takes around like 10, 10 trial to get mm -hmm. the number we have, but it's not perfect. It still have a room to improve. But with this demo or this experiment purpose, I just run 10, 10 iterations. And overall, it follow these patterns. So, when we have a use case or a task, let's say this classification, we we will start to use this uh, strongest, the largest model to, to try it out. Since we know the larger one is supposed to be a smarter one, then we will do some prompt, basically ask, help me to classify this complaint into this five category. Then we run the same model on this 300 testing data, basically 300 cluster complaints, then to get our uh, output. Then the output will say if the accuracy is higher than our acceptable threshold, which is 75%. If yes, then we can try to try smaller model. And mm -hmm. um, since we want to get the benefit for the faster uh, more cost effective and more sustainable. But with smaller model, since it's not that smart enough, you will put more effort in the prompting, basically give more clear instructions, uh, give more examples. And then we do this again to see if we can get similar or even better performance. If yes, we go, go scale down, go smaller model again. So this is uh, it iterations uh, experiment uh, I did. And the result here, we will start with um, um, the accuracy. So the accuracy, you can see the star uh, on, on top of the three billion model. And uh, another part is the prompting effort. You can see the smaller, smallest model require higher effort to prompting. Mm -hmm. and when, when I mentioned the prompting effort here, maybe on two way to use prompt to get this better performance. The first one we call that uh, uh, a few shot prompting. What that mean is basically you give uh, a few examples.
to the prompt. Mm -hmm. And um, this, a few can be zero to five, or if you get zero, that is zero shot. It's basically asked language, large language model to, to guess what you want. And uh, if you give a, a, a few more examples, the performance or accuracy was supposed to be better. So we call that hard prompt, like hard coding, or you just give the example to the models and uh, tell them what you want. Um, that is what I did on this 8 billion and 70 billion uh, model. The 8 billion model, I gave five examples. 70 billion, I gave three examples. You can see there get a similar performance. 8 billion is 74%, 70 billion is 77%. Um, percent. So consider the significant difference on the size. The difference mm -hmm. on the accuracy is, I uh, will say, not that significant. Is similar performance. Um, another uh, prompting techniques to get the better performance called soft prompting. So it, that mean instead of giving a few example, you give hundreds of example. For example, this one, I gave uh, 500 examples. And that 500 examples will basically become um, another layer for the neural network. It's supposed to learn more patterns, what you want, more learn more granular um, requirement from these hundreds of the examples. That is what I did on this smallest 3 billion model that mm -hmm. gave us this even higher accuracy than the 70 billion, which is 81%. So that is for accuracy perspective. And if we consider um, another metrics will be the um, latency or how fast this model will respond. Um, oh, the winner, yeah, the winner will be 8 billion model. The latency here is um, less than one second. It's like 273 millisecond. And that is not a big difference. Maybe for people, since the 70 billion is like 400 millisecond and 3 billion mm -hmm. is 500 second, millisecond, uh, that is not a big difference for people. You Maybe you don't notice that. But in our use case, we only predict or generate one or two tokens. Remember the credit mm -hmm. card or mortgage. Think about it if you have a sentence, have a... 10 words or 20 words. So that will be like easily be two seconds compared to five seconds compared to four seconds. So that become more noticeable and uh, is important for engagement, customer engagement. You want to have a low latency to make that experience better. Um, and also you notice the smaller is the model 3 billion is longer that because mm -hmm. we add Additional layer in the model with that soft prompt. So that layer will need some time to calculation. Um, then we'll go to next and metrics will be the, um, the cost. Uh, this one, I normalize the cost. The cheapest okay. one is the uh, 3 billion. So if we consider that is one, then the 70 billion, the largest, larger one will be nearly seven um, more expensive. Mm -hmm. And even this prompting or large language model is not very expensive. It's like a one or a few dollars per one million token, but it's always go, uh, the billing go up faster than you thought. Then for example, the, the, the experiment I did only take me like half day. I already used half million tokens to do it. Yes. Yeah, think about it is your, is um, customer faced or enterprise level, you multiply 100 thousands, this will make a big difference on the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, the last one, but not the least one will be this um, uh, carbon, carbon friendly. Um, so this one we, um, is mainly on this uh, consumption or the power side. So for a smaller model, you can think about it is uh, you don't need many powers to run that. If we think about this on this uh, minimum setup, and we know that the 
the model needs some computation power. Let's say we need a GPU. Uh, we will take this uh, um, NVIDIA GPU as an example to have this minimum size set up for a 3 billion model, you only have, the requirement is uh, 150 power watt. And, but this large one, 70 billion is um, uh, 1200 watt. That's to exponentially power. larger. Yeah. Right? So that is a huge amount of power. Yeah, uh, nearly eight times power, more power required. Since for the smaller model, you may need, uh, like, say, a specific GPU called A, A10 that only have, that have a 24 uh, gigabyte. That is enough for the 3 billion. Mm -hmm. But for the 70 billion model, is much larger. You need uh, maybe four A100. So A100 is larger than A10. And, of course, it comes more power and this is a minimum setup so this minimum yeah. setup for example this uh, uh, three billion maybe only support uh, a few people to access at the same time if you think about the chat gpt that is massive like worldwide maybe mm -hmm. thousands ten thousand people can talk with chat gpt at the same time um for your enterprise level that can be um you, you you will not run this on the minimum side up. You can maybe easily multiply 10. So that difference is make a big difference. Uh, yeah. yeah. That is for the carbon uh, friendly side. So overall this, um, with your right prompt skills, you can achieve faster, better, and more sustainable for your business. Otherwise, if you go straight to the large one, large language model without the prompts to um, in in your uh, in your team or in in this setup, you may facing this. Uh, you will pay the price, but got this under delivered performance. So no one want that. And um, also another analogy when I finish this talk is people say is basically depend on the driver. So if the driver is more exper experienced, they may know how to drive. They can uh, beat a V twelve use like. Uh, family car, Toyota RA4. So that is another analogy I heard. But overall, is this prompt engineering for enterprise uh, is very important, and not only for the uh, your daily life or daily job, but also for the business applications. That that uh, is. It, it, it's fascinating to sit down and watch. Like, like just the, the the fact that you know. The, the large language model, while it sounds like the sort of thing that enterprises are going to go for because it's what everybody talks about, uh, just seeing the benefits and, and how you can use such information so pointedly to get what you need without all that expense of how much more it's going to cost or those latency issues. It's Yeah, it, it's really fascinating stuff to sit down and see. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. Hopefully that gave you some idea, the large one, smaller one, of what is prompt engineering. It's, it sounds terrible, but I guess in this case, size doesn't always matter. It can come down to the power of what's behind the scenes, which is, uh, yeah, it's yep. absolutely fascinating. It, it, if you've got a business, if there's somebody out there at the moment who's with an enterprise considering generative AI as an option for helping them out, what sort of recommendation would you give them then to look into to find the right model for them? Yeah, I think that is um, for the funded right model. Maybe we can find another uh, interview for this. Uh, there is a framework to find the right model. It's starting with a clear use case. And when yeah. you have a use case, you need to break down to tasks. On task level, you will better to identify model you need. Can be the text generation or text to image or text to speech to voice. So you may have a uh, a collection of tasks, each task you need a different model. Then you will have these options. You just list what have in the marketing. Then you go through that experiment. Try the largest one to achieve the performance or accuracy you need. Then you go try the smaller one to get more cost effective, more faster. Um, then you uh, just pick the one make most sense for your business. 
So that is uh, the suggestion and um, also what I have seen in the industry, how people do that. Um, one, one of the issues I've always come across when dealing with, with enterprise for tech is an attitude from the people with the money to go, I want this, I want this now. Um, and, and here's the money to, to make it happen. Um, what sort of time frame do you think people should be putting into doing their iterative testing to make sure that this is going to be the right function for them? Uh, is there almost like a warning for those people with the money that this is not going to be instant? Yeah, for that one, I think you, you will put more effort in the beginning to evaluate the business return. So for example, if you assuming people have co-pilot will save maybe um, 10 hours per month for the employee. So you need to make sure maybe do a, some survey to see how good your, your team is on this prompt skills and uh, maybe put some training um, to make sure everyone know how to use it. Otherwise, this mm -hmm. assumption is not a safe assumption and this money can be wasted. You, like you have the access for the co-pilot, but people doesn't use it, doesn't know how to use it. Uh, that will be step one to make sure you uh, validate the business benefit, um, not only from technology perspective, more from the people skills or the process perspective, make sure it's ready for the AI. That will be the technical part to make sure you get the right model and for the right, right uh, project. That will be monitoring iteratively to improve either the model side or the people skill sets to make sure you have the benefit that you want. So it, it's like shopping for any kind of tool. It's making sure it's fit for purpose. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's just a, yeah, kind of a, you just say hello or <laughs> ask to generate uh, some poem or some story that is not for business use. That is, yeah. Perfect. Well, I have learned so much today. Thank you very much, Shun, for coming along. I do really appreciate it. And I hope that the audience out there is getting a lot from it. Is there somewhere that we can point them to if they want to get a bit more information about this or to have a little bit more look of into sort of the experiment that you've run? Yeah, of course. Uh, feel free to reach on me. On, uh, I'm a data scientist in Tech Data. We can share my email. And also I will have some uh, content on YouTube people feel free to uh, watch that and uh, yeah brilliant thank you very much thank you right that is our episode for today i want to thank shung again for joining me it was really fascinating to sit down and listen to his presentation and learn more about those model differences. And I really hope that that was something that you learned a little bit from. If you're listening to this in the podcast version, you may want to find the video version on our YouTube channel because it's got all of the slides which give you a little bit more explanation and data points for you to be able to use for whatever research it is that you're doing. Don't forget as well to jump over to the Data Vault Innovators community to come join the conversation around this particular episode. It's always good to get feedback on that kind of thing. There's a link for that down in the bio. And finally, don't forget to like share and subscribe tell everybody else about the video let's make google's algorithm do some work for us we'll get them there eventually until next time have a fantastic week make sure you look after yourself and may the force be with you